Hello and uh, welcome to Studio Marmalade. My name is Alfred. In today's episode we're going to have a look at a Marshall amplifier from 1997. It is a 30th anniversary and for you who know your Marshall history you realize it is not the 30th anniversary of Marshall because that was 1992 but it's the 30th anniversary of the Plexi amp which was uh, released you may say in 1967. The Plexi amp, for you who don't know, is the sort of original uh, 50 watt or 100 watt Marshall amp. Uh, this example is a 1987 model, uh, that is the 50 watt. The 100 watt model uh, was called 1959. And both these models are reissued by uh, Marshall even still today. The history of the early Marshall amplifiers is uh, quite well known. It's basically that Jim Marshall and his uh, team. Um, copied more or less you may say uh, Fender Bassman amplifiers and built them in London in the early 60s. So just like the Bassman uh, construction the early Marshalls uh, were built with 606 power tubes and uh, rectified tubes. In the Marshalls they were usually the GZ34. Since the supply of 606 power tubes in Europe was uh, quite rare at the time and Jim Marshall and the crew decided to move on to first KT66 tubes and later on uh, to EL34 power tubes, which is the kind of tube that ever since has sort of been more or less synonymous with Marshall. Uh, the name Plexi comes from the fact that the early Marshalls had a, a front panel made of plastic, a silk screen printed plastic, uh, actually a plexiglass and therefore the name Plexi. The very first model that Jim Marshall uh, produced was the JTM 45, 45 watt um, basement basically. Uh, and the construction uh, evolved. Uh, they also made the JTM 45 combo, the Bluesbreaker combo, uh, also known as 1962 model. Uh, and uh, by 1967 they both uh, changed the tubes to EL34s. And they also skip the rectifying tube, the GZ34, uh, and uh, in favor for a diode uh, rectifier. This also increased the power of the amp from uh, 45 watt to approximately 50 watt, uh, and therefore the model was called JTM50, or as it was uh, more commonly known, the 1987. Around the same time uh, they also launched the 1959 model which uh, is then the 100 watt uh, version of the very same amp actually. The 1987 and 1959 is basically the same thing. There were also base amp versions like the 1985 and uh, a PA model I think maybe named 1984 which basically is a uh, a vocal PA system, but it's pretty much the same amp, just a few minor modifications. The amp we're going to have a look at today is, as I said, a um, Plexi anniversary, 30th anniversary from 1997. And I guess all guitar enthusiasts already know what a 50 watt Marshall uh, head sounds like. Uh, it's uh, probably the most iconic classic uh, sound of rock. So there's uh, really nothing special with the sound from this amp. However, the 30th anniversary that Marshall made in 1997 uh, were made as a limited edition. I think this uh, head was made in 100 or 200 examples and they were covered in white tulex. So that's quite spectacular. It's absolutely beautiful. I mean, the, the black Marshalls are beautiful too, but this really stands out on stage. It comes with a matching uh, white Tulex 4x12 with Celestian greenbacks. Funny thing though, the greenbacks in this 1987 uh, 4x12 are actually, well by definition they are greenbacks because they are greenback specifications but the <laughs> covers of the, uh, of the speakers themselves are actually cream colored. But they are not greenbacks, they are greenbacks, 25 watt Celestion speakers. Uh, since the 4x12 is uh, quite a piece to carry around, I left the white Tulex one in my office in town. Uh, so I'm going to be playing the head through my uh, Ampeg cabinet, a 4x12 early 90s 
also equipped with Celestian speakers. Uh, the amplifier is equipped with uh, four inputs, a high and a low input for uh, the normal channel and a high and low input for the bright channel in the very same way as the, um, uh, the Fender Bassman was designed. And uh, apart from that there's a four band EQ, a bass middle treble presence controls and a volume control for each channel. There is no master volume on this amp. Uh, the master volume was introduced on the Marshalls in the early 70s. So the sound is uh, very familiar. It's a typical Marshall sound. Quite loud, um, of course, 50 watt is quite a lot. And it uh, breaks up absolutely beautiful. Just uh, crank up the volume a bit. I prefer to link the input channels, uh, the bright and the normal channel with a patch cable in order to get the um, uh, the bright uh, sound from the bright channel and the uh, more muddier sound from the normal channel. Individually I think that they are actually uh, a bit too bright and a bit too muddy for my tastes but combined they produce uh, absolutely a fantastic sound. There is only one sound. Uh, there is no way to make a Marshall sound different but hey why would you need a Marshall to sound different than a Marshall? So let's uh, hook this up um, and uh, hear what it sounds like. For the first demo I choose to play my red old Japanese uh, Fender Stratocaster. It's an early 80s, I think it's from 1982, in which I have changed the pickups uh, to Tone Rider City Limits. Uh, in between the guitar and the amp there's a pedal board on which I'm only using the wah pedal, a more the water and the compressor, an old Boss CS3 uh, compressor sustainer. As you may see, I have dialed all the tone controls around uh, 5, apart from the mid-range control, which is around 6, and the bass, which is around uh, 4. I've linked the channel 1 and 2 using the white uh, patch cable in the far right in the picture, uh, which means I'm using both channel 1 and channel 2, and since channel 1 is the bright channel, uh, I have uh, dialed this down a bit, it's around 4, and the channel 2, which is a bit muddier sound, is around 6. And even though none of the channels are driven very hard, uh, as I said, the volume is on 4 and 6, the amp breaks up uh, quite a bit actually, a um, bit more than I expected to, and there's uh, quite a lot of more gain to give if you want to. However, the volume of the amp is not going to be very much louder than it is here. And turning up the volume knobs will only give more saturation, more overdrive or distortion. The cabinet is an early 90s Ampeg 4x12. I'm not entirely sure what speakers are in this cabinet, but it's some sort of Celestian anyway. And for the microphone, I choose the standard Shure SM57. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
So I've now put the white plexi head on the workbench and I'm gonna open it up and uh, clean some potentiometers because there's some noise in the, uh, well, basically all of the potentiometers in the app. And also gonna take out all the tubes and do some measuring there. And I'm gonna, of course, uh, check the capacitors, uh, though I don't think they need changing. Uh, and also gonna check the voltages on the tubes. So here we go. We have the three ECC 83s from the left. We have the two EL34 sockets on the right. We have two large um, filter capacitors on the far right. Underneath here is the power transformer. Then comes the uh, output transformer, I guess. And that should be the choke. And. Uh, you may also see that on this board uh, there, are, there are only small resistors and a few small capacitors mounted on the board. All the big components are mounted in the chassis, screwed to the chassis or riveted to the chassis actually. Yeah, looks pretty neat to me. And it looks like this volume control, no, not volume control, prisons control might have been replaced. This is not the same type of potentiometer as the other ones. Let's hook it up to the uh, speaker and see if we get any sound. Let's heat up the tubes. Now we can hear some noise coming from the the uh, mid-range potentiometer. Nothing from the bass, nothing from the treble, and quite a bit from the presence control. Oh, that is bad. That's really bad. Need to clean that. Interesting also that the uh, Volume control of the channel 2. Well, it gives some noise in the speaker, but the volume control channel 1, it makes so much noise. I'm not quite sure that's supposed to be like that. I mean, it's, it's not supposed to be like that. It's Check the tubes and I'm gonna um, clean the potentiometers that needs cleaning. Just to make sure that there's no uh, no charges left in the uh, capacitors, uh, I'm gonna short these to ground using a, a device that I made including a resistor which then discharge the capacitors fairly quick but not too quick. For trying the tubes I have my orange VT 1000 I think it's called, valve tester. Um, 
It's a fairly simple valve tester and it only gives me basic information about the tube but for this purpose just to make sure whether the uh, both halves of the ECC 83 are mm, somewhat the same and within a desirable range uh, this tester is uh, quite enough. Um, and uh, it actually says that this is a fail. So no wonder there's so much noise on that channel 1 or was it channel 2. So I'm probably going to test this again because my experience has shown that what shows to be a fail first time may not be failed second time. Just to make sure I'm going to try it again but I'm going to go through all the ECC 83s before I check it again. There are only five tubes in this amp. It's quite amazing how loud only the two EL34s can be. <laughs> um, I also noticed in this uh, on the PCB that it actually says 1959 SLP uh, on the PCB. And the 1959 is then of course the 100 watt model uh, with four EL34s. It must be a sort of a slightly bigger chassis as well because they wouldn't fit in this. Uh, so I guess they use the same um, circuit board for the 50 and 100 watt model which makes sense because the only difference should actually be the number of output tubes uh, and some uh, small differences in the power section. I mean the preamp section which is basically what is on the printed circuit board it's all the same no matter if it's a 50 watt or 100 watt uh, amp. So it makes sense, but I'm a bit surprised because I was expecting it to say 1987, which is the uh, the name of the uh, 50 watt uh, classic Marshall. Second tube tested. It says an eight and an eight and a nine, and it says good. It's good to me. Good to know. Replace it there. Trying the. Testing third ECC 83. Testing of the third ECC 83 uh, turns out okay. It's a six and a nine. And when I say six and a nine, that's according to Orange's own um, scale, sort of say. And here we have another fail. Oh, not another fail. This is the same. This is the tube one. It's a 4 and a 10, a blinking 10, but it says fail. So I think I'm gonna take this tube and put it aside. I'm gonna collect a new one. So I have collected another ECC83 from my drawer. You may not be surprised to hear that I have quite a collection of both new and used tubes. And this is an electroharmonics. I think this used to be in my PV Classic. It may actually even be the original tubes from my PV Classic. So I'm going to test this just to make sure nothing has happened to it. It has been tested before. I think it read a six, uh, seven and a six. And this says uh, a seven and a seven actually. And this is good, which is perfect. See it fits in this socket because of the shielding there. Now it's okay. It fits. Now we're gonna try out the EL34s which are mounted with this spring-loaded tube holder which is good because it stays in place but was a bit difficult to take out of the amp. Find the pin and change the valve to uh, EL34 and the power tubes in this amp are not the originals. I can see that because uh, these are Svetlana's uh, made in Russia. Uh, and to be honest, I don't know what was in the amp to begin with. But this is branded LH, which is, which is a Swedish company who uh, grades and sells tubes. So by this little sticker on it, I can see that it was uh, sold in Sweden, this tube. And I don't think that Marshall bought their tubes from LH. And the first tube reads an 11 and it says good. Which is perfect. 11 is actually really good. And we 
try the second one. And if we're lucky, we get a reading uh, at 11 on this tube, or at least uh, 10 or 12, uh, which means uh, that it would be uh, matching the first EO34 that we tried. And we get a reading of 10, which is uh, close enough. So we'll take this out of the tester and just mark it with a 10. So now we know all the tubes should be fairly okay. Next step will be to plug the amp back in and uh, see if we got rid of the noise in the preamp section, which I hope was due to this tube that I replaced. I will turn it on. Let it heat up for a bit. Still makes an awful lot of hissing noise on the uh, channel one. So I think it's actually better. Of course, this is the bright channel. And taking the treble down helps it a bit. And also note this speaker is not really like a guitar speaker. Um, this is not a guitar speaker, it's a small PA speaker. And it's got a lot more high frequencies than most guitar amp speakers do. I still don't like that no hissing noise, but I'm not sure if we're going to do anything about it. We're going to need to measure the bias of the amp. And actually, I should have measured the output transformer before I turn back on the power. But let's listen to the potentiometer, so the presence is still not good. And it's also not quite fixed in the chassis. Nothing in the base. The middle control seems to be quiet now. And so does the treble. I'm just gonna make sure that I fix this uh, potentiometer because it's not quite tightly mounted. And of course that's not what's causing it to make the noise, but I don't like it when it's not properly in place. So I'm gonna some more cleaner in there and I'm also gonna do um, some measuring of the output transformer. I admit I had to cave and download the proper schematic for the uh, this version of the amp. After doing that I could then conclude that the output transformer could be measured between the capacitor over here the 2 times 50 microfarad I think um, to yeah, 50 plus 50 microfarad, 500 volt capacitor, which is one of the filter capacitors, which is before the shock. Uh, so from that capacitor, from the two halves of that capacitor, actually, so it acts as one 100 uh, microfarad capacitor. From there, it uh, goes uh, wire to the center tap of the transformer. So I can measure from there and then to the uh, respective uh, plate connectors on the tube sockets, which is then pin number three. So here we go. First of all, set this to measuring resistance. So there we have on the first tube 41.6. And on the second tube, 42, 42.1, 42.2, 42.1, 41.6 and 42.1. Next thing I will do is uh, measure the voltage drop over that capacitor. No, sorry, over that uh, half of the transformer. 
I am plugging the power in, so after this I need to keep my hands clear. Of course I should always keep my hands clear, but it's even more important now that we're live. The speaker is uh, connected already, has been all the time. Now we can also hear if I manage to get rid of the noise in the presence potentiometer. Taking it off standby. Still some noise from the presence control. I don't like the sound of that. Anyway, now we're measuring the voltage drop over the transformer. Pretty exactly 1.5 volt. And the other one, 1.42. Now I also need the uh, plate voltages. I'm gonna measure on the pin 3 of the output tubes, 435 volts and 436, 435, 436. Using my plate dis dissipation uh, calculator, uh, entering the 435 volts, I get a reading that we should have around a 34 and a half milliamp current flowing through the tubes and at the moment we seem to have 36.5 and 33.7 uh, so they're not entirely matched but I'd say it's close enough so nothing needs to be done with the um, uh, the bias of the amp. The final check that I'm going to do is check all the tube voltages and we have here from the almighty tube amp book um, the uh, voltage charge for Marshall 50 watt amps and I guess these were written way before this amp was built but it seems like in the old marshes they didn't really change that very much. So it should make sense anyway. Here we should have a 180, we are reading 181, that's close enough. On pin 3, 1.6. No, that's not good. We're reading 0.9 volts. Pin number 6, 223 should be 160 and then the other yellow one over here 1.7 should be 1.6 okay it is a shame that uh, they have not put the voltages in the chart like Fender do most of the time I am getting very different readings uh, on the first and second cathode of the first uh, preamp tube. And it should be an 820 ohm resistor on both ones there. And it makes no sense that these two should differ that much unless there is something wrong with either resistor or one of the capacitors C1 or C2. Because apart from the uh, uh, resistors there, which should be 820 ohm, both of them. Um, there are only the capacitors. Are they attached to the same point underneath? No, they should be pretty much the same. I need to look into this. I may as well check the other cathode resistors on the second valve. We have an 820 and a 100K. Uh, and on the last one, and they're parallel because that's the phase inverter, and uh, that's the R17, uh, should be 470, which also makes sense. There is some, definitely something weird with the um, first valve. So I just found that the, um, uh, the schematic that I found for the 1987 which is supposed to be the reissue model and all uh, is not the the correct one for this amp 
it's uh, very similar, of course. Um, it's a Marshall, so they're they're always similar. <laughs> but uh, there are some small differences. For instance, the cathode uh, resistors on the first tube in this schematic are both 820 ohm, which then should give uh, the same reading on the voltage on cathode one and two on the first ECC 83. Um, however, in the what seems to be original uh, drawing, or at least the drawing for this amp, there's 820 ohm resistor on cathode uh, one, I think, and a 2.7 kilo ohm resistor on cathode two, which then, of course, means that the voltage on cathode one and two will be very different. So uh, it seems to be um, correct. Um, looking at the PCB here, you can also see there are some uh, components missing. Not missing, but they're not in this uh, construction. For, for instance, uh, com capacitor 1718, capacitor 6, uh, capacitor 21. And you may also notice that this capacitor is connected between the connection for uh, capacitor 15 and 16. I found another schematic which is way more difficult to read and I didn't print it, uh, but which actually tells us it should be uh, 820 ohm uh, and 2.7 kilo ohm on the first two uh, cathodes of the of the first uh, tube. So it's probably just uh, just as it should be. Um, and the noise uh, from the first uh, gain stage of the bright channel may not sound that harsh in a proper guitar speaker. So what I'm gonna do now is um, put this back together. Um, I'm gonna do a visual check of all the capacitors, uh, but I think they're okay. And then I'm gonna put it together and uh, play it through my uh, 4x12 again. I'm actually going to wait putting the back cover on until I've tried it properly in the amp because it's it's just no fun taking apart and unscrewing it again. So now I've plugged in my Epiphoneless pole into the white Marshall and into the uh, Ampeg 4x12. And this is what it sounds like. <laughs> channel that is not the bright channel but the normal uh, channel 2 same thing but with the bright channel channel 1 I seem to have uh, got rid of all the uh, noises in the potentiometers more or less some noise in the presence, nothing in the bass, nothing in middle, nothing in the treble. And the volume runs smooth. Before there were some points uh, on the volume that didn't work, but I cleaned that with the a cleaner. I was 
strikes me as a bit weird is that the channel 1 is extremely bright. And uh, I know it's a bright channel, but it's extremely bright. And also, there seems to be no way of getting uh, the channel 1, the bright channel, to play um, uh, without breaking up. And I don't know if that's uh, deliberate by Marshall to get this classic Marshall rock crunchy sound from the start on the volume. But I was a bit surprised because I was expecting it to be clean, maybe up to four or five, and then breaking up there. Uh, this may have to do some, with something in the, uh, the preamp and the first gain stage that I was mentioning before. Uh, the changing of the 820 ohm resistor to the 2.7K on the first cathode uh, on the first gain stage. Uh, because, of course, that would change the working point of the gain stage and, uh, I guess, uh, giving it a uh, higher gain, simply. It doesn't really make a difference because it sounds absolutely fantastic, but I cannot seem to play this clean. Let me show you. This is then channel 1, the bright channel. barely touching the string, the strings with a pick and as soon as I um, strum it a bit harder then and it only takes a little bit more gain The second channel, the clean channel, oh no, sorry, the not bright, the normal channel is uh, on the other hand very, um, I wouldn't say dull, but uh, very much muddier than the bright channel. I know that this is actually the bridge pickup of the Les Paul uh, using the neck pickup, would make it even uh, more mellow. There's uh, noticeably more, less gain on the uh, normal channel than the bright channel. But still, not clean, still breaking up. <laughs> I find the best combination is uh, uh, a little bit higher uh, volume on the normal channel, a little less on the bright, uh, just to actually, well, to blend in the, the duller sound of channel 2 and the brighter sound of channel 1 giving it a pretty classic martial sound. That's all for this demo. I'm gonna put the uh, back panel back on the amp because I don't think there's anything more I need to do on this. And uh, maybe record uh, one more track just for you to hear what it sounds like.
Thank you for watching this video. If you like what you've seen and heard, then please uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, I will be back soon again with more guitars, amps and other sound related stuff. See you soon. Bye.